Hey guys, welcome to another video. I haven't done one of these for quite some time, so this will be an unscripted video. And the idea is to give you an alternative to the rising prices of uh, retro computer parts. Now, I play a part of this, of course. Um, me doing YouTube videos that gets uh, people interested and more people coming into the retro gaming scene. Of course, they want to buy some parts, so um, that has the result that prices are going up, especially if you're chasing items that are more collector's items, yeah. But uh, I try really hard and I do videos showing you budget alternatives. For example, you could try to get a GeForce 256 or instead just go for a GeForce 2MX400, which is exactly at the same performance level and you can use similar drivers and so on. And what we're doing today is we're going to use something a little bit more modern and we're going to build uh, a 386 equivalent uh, DOS retro gaming PC. So it'll perform uh, right about uh, at the level of a 386. And it's a concept I've used many times in the past. I remember how my retro journey started off. Um, I spent, uh, I signed up with Vogons and there were all these people building these high performance PCI best based 486 machines with DX4 100s and Cyrix and so on. It was, uh, even back then, uh, those prices were quite steep. And so I came along and I had a look, well, why not just go with a Pentium and turn off the CPU caches and bam, you've got kind of um, the same thing. And back then, yeah, people thought it was a little bit crazy or whatever, but um, yeah, prices have gone up and now SuperSocket 7 machines um, are very sought after. I got an email the other day from someone um, saying if she, if that person should go for a $200 motherboard, and that's ridiculous, $200 for an old motherboard. So yes, I've got all the parts laid out. I will not be using a computer case. Um, they take up a lot of space and they make working uh, a little bit more awkward and unnecessary. You guys know how to put stuff into a computer case. I'm not going to waste time with that. I'm going to use an open test bench and we're going to start with talking about the motherboard. So throughout the video, I will talk a little bit about alternatives and substitutes, but with the motherboard, uh, you need to make sure it has a chipset from VIA. Now, I chose this motherboard, it's, it's from PC Chips. It's a non-desirable brand, to be honest, and I think I got this for, for $15. The chipset uh, that I recommend going for is the VIA KT266A. It's a very good chipset but more importantly is that it's got a via Southbridge and the via Southbridge connects directly to the PCI slots and we will be using um, a PCI sound card that is extremely compatible with DOS, one of these sound cards with the Yamaha YMF744 chip. As an alternative, you can get something uh, with an ESS chip. This is the ESS uh, Solo 1, also very good. We will come back to these um, later. So get yourself a cheap Socket A motherboard. Um, Socket A motherboards are really interesting. At the high end you have the NVIDIA Enforce 2 motherboards and yeah people spend huge money on those getting an Athlon XP 3200 plus and uh, yeah maxing it out. But my approach is if you're building a fast machine like that just go for Athlon 64. Um, so I always think about the next step up. You could build a high-end machine of a certain type, but I find it more interesting in going with the next step up and getting average parts. For some reason, I'm always budget-oriented. Um, people think I have all sorts of um, expensive parts stashed away, but that's actually not my approach. I'm just a little bit ahead of the curve. Um, so at the moment I'm looking at socket 775 stuff and that seems to be uh, where the value is at the moment. I'm actually not buying, I haven't been buying retro parts f uh, of this nature for quite a while to be honest, especially with ISA or 386, 486. I've got all the stuff I wanted and uh, there's no need to buy any more. So um, socket A, there's usually an issue with the power supply. 
and they draw most of the current from the 5 volt rails. This is not an issue, we're going to go with a really slow processor. So um, you can use a modern ATX case, a modern power supply, modern uh, input devices, keyboard and mouse and so on. Uh, yeah. Next up is the choice of processor. Slow is good. So the general theme for this build is slow is good. So go for the slowest parts that you can find. Um, two recommendations. We have here an AMD uh, Duron. These are quite interesting. They go in clock speeds, I think. You can get them down to around 600, 700 megahertz. Uh, the model we have here, uh, let me have a look. That's an 800 megahertz model, so that's perfect. They also, I think they've got less cache and therefore run a little bit slower, but not much, but do consume less power. Um, they have less transistors. An alternative is the AMD Geode. This is the NX1500. That one runs at 1 gigahertz. Very interesting chip. Um, you can use software and downclock the multiplier to 3x. So with 100 megahertz front of bus, you can clock it down to 300 megahertz. So um, these two chips are what I recommend. We're going to go for the Athlon. I think this one is more readily available but the geode should work just as well. And maybe that's something we look at in a future video. But for the time being, we're gonna go with the AMD Athlon. Okay, now we're just gonna insert the processor and the way I do this, I have a look at the CPU, we can see two uh, angled uh, tapered off sections here and they line up with the socket. So you just slot it in. There shouldn't be any um, reason to use force. They should just drop in. If it doesn't go in, very likely one of your pins is bent and you have to uh, straighten them out. I like using a mechanical pencil um, to straighten out the pins. Okay, that's all done. We need some thermal paste. I like to use Arctic MX4. You really need just a little uh, hint of thermal paste, not much at all. These processors don't have um, an IHA chase, uh, so it's really straightforward. And now we're just going to mount the processor. You can see there's a bit of a uh, gap here that lines up with that plastic bit. And off we go. So just going to mount it on this side. And then for the other bit, we need a screwdriver. And we're just going to push it down. And that's it, all installed. Attach the fan, and we're good to go. And next we need some RAM. So this motherboard uses DDR memory. And yeah, just get the stick of RAM with the smallest amount of memory. 256 seems to be my smallest. Um, if I had um, like a 16 megabyte stick, I would use that. But with DDR, you can't unfortunately go down to such low capacities. So 256 megabyte stick will have to do. Most games will work just fine. There are a few troublemakers, but you can limit the RAM with software. Now it's also a good time to secure the motherboard, so I'm just gonna quickly put in a few uh, screws just to give it a bit more stability. If you're working with an ATX case, of course, then you have to spend a little bit more time on installing the motherboard with the I.O. shield and all of that, but it's all uh, pretty straightforward and common sense. And now we're gonna have to talk about the video card. You have a choice, you can get an AGP video card or something PCI based. Now, usually with video cards that have 3D acceleration, like a TNT or, or whatever, um, the PCI flavors are usually more expensive, but you might find something like this. This has a Cirrus Logic chip or something from S3. You might find these at a better price. We don't need 3D acceleration. We're just gonna play DOS. Um, Cirrus Logic is a brand I like. Even back in the day, they've been good value, so they were priced cheaper, they have good compatibility and good speed, so you could go with a PCI graphics card. This one has a VGA out. Later, I will hook this up to the Capture PC, and we're gonna go through all the software setup, bias, and so on. So that's why I'm gonna use this graphics card. This one has DVI, DVI out, so I, this just makes my life easier for capturing. That's why I'm using a FX 5200. Otherwise, I would not be using this card. Um, in general, the VGA output is a lot sharper and clearer. Uh, on NVIDIA cards, the DVI output is uh, a little bit blurry, but still, it makes my life easier for capturing. That's why I'm going with this video card. Also, I want to say a few things. There is this um, 
uh, GONAS, uh, VGA compatibility matrix, and a lot of people uh, look at that matrix, they consider a certain video card, it's got a lot of red flags, and they immediately uh, dismiss it. And you're just going to be careful. Um, the games on that compatibility matrix, a lot of them are like, yeah, no one plays them. They're really, they're not, um, yeah, popular games or whatever. So don't discount a video card just yet. Try the games that you want to play first. You will actually be surprised. Um, I think 95% of DOS games will work just fine on any sort of graphics card. So I'm just going to secure this video card and we are good to go. And now we have to talk about sound and sound cards. Oh my God, this is where people get really uh, fired up when it comes about which sound card to use and uh, prices, external MIDI modules. So you can spend a ton of money. But luckily with the PCI sound cards uh, with DOS compatibility, prices are extremely good. Um, no one seems to be looking at them at the moment. So um, look, that might change in five or 10 years, but at the moment you can pick sound cards up for around 20 to $30 and they have excellent DOS comp uh, compatibility. We're gonna look at two models. Um, I've been using and recommending this sound card for a while. It is uh, an AOPEN Cobra sound card with the Yamaha YMF744 chipset. And there are a couple of really good things about this sound card. It has a authentic Yamaha OPL3 chip, so FM sounds absolutely beautiful, just as good as any Sound Blaster or Adlib card out there. Also, these are available as new old stock. The seller still has uh, stock when we did the promotion video. Uh, what I mean with that, I often work with uh, eBay sellers. I contact them if they have something interesting and they have stock for my viewers to buy. I contact them and say, hey, can I do a video? In return, you um, send me a few sound cards and I'll promote your uh, eBay shop and then people can buy the sound card. And yeah, we, we sold around 200 of these over a weekend or something like that. And he still had a thousand left. So um, there should be still plenty of stock left. However, having said that, we have seen items in the past where people thought they had time to buy, like the NEC Wavetable board, um, another product that was in a similar situation was the Audition 32 um, Sound Blaster and also Voodoo 3 cards out of the US, dirt cheap, 20 or $25, they're all gone. So don't hesitate too long. If you um, think this is a sound card that you're gonna use in a build, just buy a few, um, put them aside and you never know when they come in handy. Worst case, in a few years, you can trade it for something else. So very interesting sound card. The other option is a chip with, um, from ESS, the ESS Solo 1. A bit harder to find, but also very interesting. Doesn't have the authentic OPL3, but it has the ESFM, which is one of the best uh, clones. It will sound different in some situations, but unless you're really familiar with how FM sounds and you're a bit of a, yeah, if you're picky or you can easily tell differences, then this might not actually uh, matter. Um, compared to two sound cards, and this is just my personal experience that I'm sharing, I haven't done any shootouts or whatnot, the Yamaha sounds uh, better with the authentic OPL3, but the ESS sound card is slightly more compatible. It doesn't require um, EMS um, memory manager, and I've tried this myself, so the ESS Solo One will work with slightly more games. Now we're talking, uh, it's really splitting hairs here. It's not like that twice as many games will work on the ESS. Um, it's, it's, you could say 98%, 99%, something like that. It's, it's really just a handful of games that have issues with uh, EMS memory. To give you a few examples, for example, Turrican 2 will work on the sound card just fine. Another game that has issues is um, Wing Commander Privateer, I believe. Um, it doesn't use EMS, it's actually got its integrated EMS manager and it will fail on the Yamaha, but will work on the ESS Solo 1. Now, because I've used the Yamaha in the past and I know how the drivers work and everything, we're gonna use this card for the time being, but eventually there will be a proper review about the ESS Solo 1 sound card. And there are quite a few other parts that we need. Let's start with storage. 
Um, there are lots of options. You can use an authentic IDE hard drive, a modern SATA drive. You can, for example, get a Seagate drive, use C tools to limit the capacity, turn it into a 30 gig hard drive or something like that, and use SATA to IDE adapters. But for pure DOS gaming, I like using either compact flash or SD card adapters. So this is a typical model. It needs a floppy power connector here. So you have to look on your power supply. This one only has one floppy power connector. So you might get one of these adapters that goes for Molex and it splits into two of those. Really cheaply available on eBay for a dollar or two. So get a pack of five or so and you have them um, for a future project. SD cards. Um, I buy them from the supermarket, that's a SanDisk, 16 gigabytes, um, very low, uh, well, basically there's no access time, so that's the beauty, and they work really well under DOS. Um, in general, I often use a single ID cable to connect an optical drive and the hard drive, but these adapters often don't like that, so we're using two dedicated uh, ID cables. So. This goes into the storage adapter. Just going to plug it in. And then that goes into the primary slot of the motherboard, just like that. And I'm just going to put this down here for the time being. Also, a floppy drive. Years ago, I started um, using these GoTech floppy emulators, and I loved them to bits. No more. Uh, read errors, they're reliable. I put myself, I built myself uh, one USB flash drive and it's got like 100 images and it's got everything I need to uh, set up DOS and we will be looking at that later in the video. I'm gonna hook this up to the capture computer. I'm gonna show you the whole process from partitioning, formatting the hard drive, installing DOS, uh, drivers and so on. So this will come in super handy. We also need a optical drive with an ID interface and also analog audio outputs. If your analog uh, CD music doesn't play, it might actually be the drive. I have a lot of drives that do have an output, but it's actually not working. So um, you want to you want to try a few drives before concluding that the sound card has an issue, for example. And that goes into the secondary ID connector of the motherboard. We also need one of these that connects the CD audio out coming from the optical drive um, to the sound card. Um, a lot of DOS games use CD audio music, so that's what that is for. And let me just plug that in. Okay, I'll do that later. And a modern power supply, ATX. This is a 450 watt PC from, um, yep, XFX. Really overkill, a 350 will do fine. Um, any modern ATX power supply will be happily powering this machine. And there you go, that was the easy part, putting all the hardware together. Be prepared that you might have to move the PCI sound card. That has to do with the BIOS allocating resources. Um, but that's, yeah, that's a, a minor uh, issue and easy, easy to sort out. Also for input devices, I recommend uh, PS, PS2. Go with a PS2 keyboard and mouse. That lets you disable all the USB ports on the motherboard, which will steal precious interrupts. Uh, on this motherboard, I believe the USB ports take up to three interrupts, and they are very important in DOS, especially for the sound card. So I'm going to use a PS2 keyboard and mouse. And we're done with the build. So I'm going to take this, and we're going to go to the computer lab. I'm going to hook it up to the capture computer, and then we're going to start installing the software, and I'll show you the entire process. Okay, so we're looking at a black screen. Let me just turn on the computer and hopefully we get a picture. I've ejected the SD card because I didn't want the computer to start booting. Okay, we can see the Duron being detected with 800 megahertz. One thing I skipped earlier, um, your motherboard might have a few jumpers. You want to set it to 100 megahertz FSB. So the motherboard supports 100 or 133. And remember, slow is good, so go with the 100 megahertz FSB. So on the screen, we can see a couple things. We can see that the primary master disk, um, that is the uh, IDE to SD adapter, shows up as an ATA100 device with 33 megabyte for some odd reason. And the secondary, secondary master drive is our optical drive. We can also see a table 
of PCI devices with the resources. So um, let's have a look what's going on. Interrupt 11 is for the graphics. The RD controller takes 14. 10 is our sound card and the ACPI controller is 9. So that's looking pretty good. So I'm going to reboot the machine and I'm going to go into the BIOS. So I just did a control alt delete and I'm hammering the delete key to enter the good old BIOS. So usually I load the um, defaults if I've got a choice, optimized or failsafe. We're going to go for failsafe. Slow is good. Yep. So anything to do with speed, we're going to turn off. So I do have a floppy drive connected. We will see if that works. Let's have a look if there's anything. Caches, we will turn all, off all the caches. So we're going to turn it straight into a 386. Uh, we leave that on. Self-test, that's fine. First boot device, we're going to go... We actually don't need to boot from the CD-ROM at the moment, but you can change that here. So we're going to make sure we boot from the floppy first and then from the hard drive. We can disable all the other boot devices. We don't need that one. We need that one. Everything else, uh, normal, fast. Leave that normal. That's all fine. Smart, we can turn that on. Okay, video by shadows improve video performance. We turned it off. Anything to do with performance improvement, we're going to turn off. Okay, DRAM clock, that's fine, 100 megahertz. And we're going to slow down everything. Well, it's already at the slowest, so the loading the uh, failsafe. Oh, there you go, burst length. Uh, actually, okay, we leave those. I think these are the slowest settings that we can use. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, we leave all that. Apertures are that's fine. AGP mode. Look, we can slow this down a little bit. Doesn't make a difference to be honest. Let's have a look. Uh, PCI weights zero weight state. We tur turn that off. That might slow things down a little bit. Bias cacheable. I leave that disabled. Yep, that shouldn't really make a difference. Okay, USB. We're gonna disable all of them. Um, we're going to leave the ID, that's all fine. We leave that default. We're going to disable the audio chip and the LAN. We're going to turn off all the COM and, and, and LPT ports. AGP video card, on chip USB controller, disable. USB keyboard, that's all disabled. Power management. Uh, we don't need any power management, so we're going to use it fine. Yeah, we're going to disable all that. We might have to do something here later, but I think we'll be fine for the time being. We can see here some temperatures and voltages. And let's see if we can actually downclock this further. No, 100 megahertz seems to be the lowest. Okay, I think we are good to go. We're just going to save that. And do another another boot. There you go. Memory is all checking out, and it's going to detect all the devices. Beautiful. Okay, I'm just going to shut it down, and I'm going to insert the SD card. So that's all off camera. You can't see that. And I'm also going to insert my flash drive that I've built, and I've got a table somewhere with it tells me there it is it tells me which image is on what slot so turn on the machine again we're gonna go back into the device just to auto detect just to auto detect the hard drive uh, where's that option let's have a look oh it doesn't seem to have one interesting oh it's under here okay yeah 16 gig, that's fine. And here's our optic drive, that's fine as well. We might as well just... Can we just turn them off here? No, we just leave it. Okay, that's good to go. The clock is a bit off. Let me just quickly fix that. 24th and it is 12.08. Oh Wonderful. Okay. Press F10 and press yes to boot off the floppy disk. So this might take a while. Now where do I get the floppy disk uh, floppy disk images from? I go to bootdisk.com and I've got a MS-DOS 
6.22 um, image. It's actually an executable. So you run it on a machine that has a floppy drive. Oh, I can see this. there's still a USB controller showing up. Let me just reboot again. I must have skipped that. It, it, it showed a few resources for the USB. That should be under here. Ah, there you go. All disabled. Strange. I thought I checked all of them, but obviously I didn't. So, let's boot again. So yeah, bootdisk.com, they've got excellent boot disks, DOS 6.22, but also um, Windows 95, Windows 98 SE, and I like booting from the floppy disk and then to partition and format the, uh, the hard drive that we're using. In our case, it's an SD card. So this is going to um, take a while, not too long, but it will load um, the storage driver for the optical drive. So that's a good test to see if your optical drive works and it seems to be working just fine. It's picking up the drive <laughs> and it gives the device name banana, which is quite interesting. Okay, we run FDisk. So that's the partition tool for DOS. We press option number four. Okay, there's a partition on there, but it's non-DOS. So we're going to wipe that. We're going to choose option three. Delete partition, option four, delete non-DOS. Acknowledge, press yes, it's gone. Press escape again. Now we're going to create a partition, press option one. Pre uh, create primary, option one again. And it's going to think for a while. We just got to mm, follow the prompts and the system will now restart. So what happened now, it created a primary DOS partition on the SD card. It should be two gigabytes. If it's 512 megabyte, then you might have an issue with the BIOS um, not um, supporting. Now, it shouldn't be a case if you're using a socket air machine. You should not have that issue. It should show up as a two gig partition just fine. And now we have to format it. There are a couple of tricks with formatting. If you're using a factory new SD card or compact flash card. So if it came in a package, you opened it, so it hasn't been used before, it will not boot out of the box. Um, and I get that issue. I get a lot of comments about that. So I'm going to show you what to do. So we're going to format the C drive with the slash S command, which will transfer the system files. So it's just accessing the floppy drive to get the system files. And then it's going to proceed formatting. There you go, two gigabytes. And that's another benefit of using an SD card. Formatting, partitioning, it all happens quickly. Um, if you're using a platter hard drive, especially a large one, there's nothing worse than formatting a 120 gig um, hard drive with DOS. Okay, we we'll give it a label. Label, let's call it um, Time Machine. The caps won't show up, but that's okay. So it's all formatted and the system files have been transferred. Now, the, it should boot now, but usually it doesn't. So you need to, there are a couple of commands that you can use. SysA, that's a bit redundant. It will just copy the system files across, oh, sorry, SysC. It will copy the system files across to the C drive once again and make it, to make it bootable. It's a bit redundant because we formatted it with the slash S command, but it's another tool in the toolbox that you can use. But the real command you need to use is fdisk slash mbr. Without that, if you're using a factory new SD card, you just open, the, open it out of the box, it will not boot. Okay, so we're good to go. So I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna uh, first eject my USB to see if we actually, if it's actually booting off the SD card. And once that, that, once that is confirmed, I will change the boot order so it doesn't boot from the floppy drive anymore. Starting MS-DOS, dead, wonderful. Okay, I'll put my GoTech back in the floppy drive. We're gonna reboot and I'm gonna change the boot order. So press delete. Actually, no, actually no. I'm not sure if that boot disk uses a RAM disk. Um, I, no, I don't think it does. So, uh, so for that, let's go back into the BIOS. Boot order, first boot device, hard drive, and disable that, press F10, yeah. So the reason I'm doing this uncut is 
I do often get comments about, oh, you skip things or you shorten the video, can't you just show the whole process? And yes, I can, so that's what we're doing. I'm just hammering F5 to skip all the boot stuff. And okay, it does use a, f a RAM drive, so, oh, hang on. I gotta go to the A. There's everything, fantastic. So, let's create a DOS directory. And with the copy command, asterisk dot asterisk just means everything. So we're copying everything to the C drive. So that includes uh, files like the editor, that includes very important files like this one here, the emm386.exe. We definitely need that one. Uh, we need the MSC uh, DEX, that's for the optical drive. And a check disk is important to check your integrity of your storage device. HiMem.sys, also very important. Um, DOSKey, yeah, some of those tools I don't actually use, but they can come in handy. So really, we don't need uh, a copy of DOS 6.22. We can just use that boot disk from bootdisk.com. It's got everything we need for gaming. It might be missing a few files that come with the full version of MS-DOS 6.22, but nothing that we need. Okay, next up we need some drivers and the boot menu. So um, I've got a website, philscomputerlab.com, and I use that um, to upload files to help you guys out when I do a tutorial like that. So on my GoTech on slot 38, so I'm just pressing the buttons, on 38 I've got my MS-DOS starter pack. So you can download that and it will look like this. There will be a uh, install. Let's run that and it explains what's happening. So it says don't run this from within Windows 90X, um, 98, 95. This is for pure DOS. Press a key. It copies across a mouse driver, optical driver, and autoexec batch file and config.sys. So we do a reboot and we should now have um, a functioning DOS system with uh, a boot menu for the, for the memory options and we will talk about that very shortly. So here we go, it's going to take a while. This is the boot menu. So we've got a couple of memory options. Conventional, we've got conventional memory, extended memory and, ex and expanded. And because I often do benchmarking, I've got an option without the mouse and without the optical drive. But when you play games and you don't need an optical drive, I've got an option for that because the optical drive can use a bit of memory. and this one has everything, mouse and the optical drive. Most games should work with expanded memory and you get the most amount of conventional memory. So games like uh, Wing Commander and most other games will work with this option just fine. Games that don't like an expanded memory manager, for example, uh, Turrican 2 is a good example, uh, choose the second option. And some, guy, some games don't like either of those. Um, a good example is, I believe, Alt one of the Ultima games is one of those. Um, where you don't want a memory manager, just choose this option. I'm going to with the first one because I want to see if the mouse and my CD-ROM works. So I've got the CD-ROM driver, the cute mouse driver shows up. So I'm going to press edit, which gives it a text editor. And here we go. I've got my working mouse. Okay, what I'm going to do next is shut down the computer. I'm going to eject the uh, SD card and we're going to copy across the drivers for the sound card and also some games. Okay, and we are back. So I copied a few files onto the SD card. And the first thing we're gonna do is, uh, I'll show you what I copied. So we've got DOS Bench. That's a benchmark pack. You can also download that from the website. Set Mal, that's a software tool, lets you toggle the cache on and off. And we're gonna also check that out later. Um, we've got a batch file here, ymf.bat. This will load the sound card drivers, uh, just a more convenient way. So it goes into the drivers directory, then into YMF, then it runs setup ds slash s to initialize the card, and then dsdma, which is a driver to make the sound blaster compatibility prop uh, work properly, and then a set blaster variable to have address 220, interrupt 5, and dma1, and the sound blaster pro mode and then it goes back to the root directory. So let's run DOS Bench first. Oops, caps lock. So you get a menu like this. Uh, with a 386 
type machine and that's what we have at the moment all the caches are turned off you want to use option one if you have the caches enabled go with option two for 3d bench so let's just run it and we'll see uh, we'll see what score we're getting i'm quite familiar with the uh, 3d uh, bench results so i should be able to tell you what sort of a machine this uh, equates to so here we go we're getting 16.6 that is bang on the level of a 386DX40, so it's a bit of a faster machine. So Wing Commander 1 might be a little bit uh, too fast, but Wing Commander 2 should work just fine. And now we're gonna toggle the cache. So we go into the set mul utility, set mul, and the command is uh, L1E for level 1 cache enable, I believe. And here we go. CPU detected, uh, enabling level one cache. So we go back into DOS bench. And now we have to run option two because option one is for slower PCs. It tops out at 99 FPS. So we run option two and we should get a much better result. And the type of game that we're gonna play depends if you want cache on and off. So old games like Wing Commander, um, point and click adventures run best with a 386 like Monkey Island might have some sound glitches as well but if you want to play Doom or Descent or Tomb Raider then we're gonna enable the cache so I'm gonna turn off the cache again and then we're gonna check out the sound card L1D for cache disabled so if you go into the drivers directory the mouse and the CD-ROM driver that came with the DOS starter pack the YMF directory these drivers are also available uh, on our website. You can just uh, type it in the search box and you'll find it. So set up DS, launches the configuration panel for the Yamaha sound card. Now, unfortunately, the way I've set everything up, I didn't quite think that through, is at the moment we can't capture audio. So what I'm gonna do is um, uh, capture the gameplay separately where you just hear the output coming from the sound card. Um, so that all looks fine. You can you can see that under here under um, it's grayed out interrupt mode and that that's all grayed out. Don't worry about that. There's a sound test which lets you play some sound. I've got a little speaker connected to my computer so I can hear that, but um, you can't. And FM sound just checks that the uh, FM chip is working properly. It plays a bit of music so that's all working fine. It's performing a bit sluggish. That's because we've got the cache disabled. Say save and exit. And then the second program we need is um, DSDMA. There you go. And I put all of that in the batch file. So if we do a, a restart, there you go. And I've created the batch file, it's just called YMF. That will initialize the card and load the drivers. Okay, so we're pretty much done. So I'm gonna do uh, a couple of game captures. Firstly, games with the CPU cache turned off. And then we're gonna have a look at Tomb Raider and maybe a few other games where a faster processor is required. And after that, we'll be back and we're gonna wrap up this video. Affirmative, Captain. Affirmative, Captain. Affirmative, Captain. We shall destroy Terra.
Okay guys, and we are back. There's one little thing that I forgot to do initially, and that has to do with getting CD audio. So we gotta run the software again, and it actually has a mixer in there, which you need to configure. So you go to uh, volume, and then under CD, by default, the mute was set to on, yeah? So you just have to make sure this is set to off, and then here, I believe you can set the uh, negative decibel just you can quiet you can basically make it a little bit quieter also if you're using the auxiliary input or the line input yeah you <coughs> also have to configure the mixer settings here and there's another mixer option here legacy so that might be for some sound plaster compatibility or something like that yeah so just in case if you're wondering if your CD audio why your CD audio doesn't work you need to go in here um, unmute it and then make sure you save the settings. And now let's summarize this video. So here is the finished build. I just uh, basically unplugged it from the capture computer and moved it all into this room once again. So that's the system how I used it. So what have we got? We saw that with the um, setup that we have here and disabling the caches, we basically got ourselves a 386 and by using um, the right sound card, we're getting an authentic OPL3 and really good sound quality. I also tested that the joystick worked in Wing Commander 2. I used uh, an analog uh, joystick which go goes into the sound card. And after changing the mixer settings in the software, the CD audio uh, was also working. We then uh, turned on the caches and we tried some faster games. Doom, for example, um, runs much better with the caches enabled and uh, also Tomb Raider, high resolution, 640 by 480, and that's where the Athlon uh, has a lot of power. Unlike the older K6 processors, which had a fairly weak floating uh, point unit, the Athlon is extremely powerful, so demanding DOS games will uh, be silky smooth on this machine. And also here's the PS2 keyboard and mouse, nothing special. Um, if you wanna use USB input devices, depending on the motherboard that might actually work. You just gotta make sure that it doesn't uh, gobble up too many interrupts. And now just a bit of a reality check. So I'm not saying that this is exactly a 386. Compatibility should be pretty good. Now, even if you build a 386, not every game is gonna work. Um, I see this in forums all the time. So don't think if you spend uh, big money on a 386 with ISA stuff that every game is gonna work. You will run into issues. It's just the nature of the beast. There are compatibility issues. Um, but I can tell you that most of the games, maybe 90, 95% of the DOS games will work just fine on this machine. And you have upgrade options, yeah? So you can uh, switch the graphics card, go with uh, PCI, uh, which might uh, be more compatible. You can plug in a CAT, because we still have VGA outputs. For the sound, you can get a, a Yamaha Sound Canvas, sorry, <laughs> a Roland Sound Canvas or a Yamaha uh, MU80 or something like that to improve uh, your general MIDI to get better music. But yeah, and put everything in a case so it doesn't look um, as rushed as this built. But yeah, hopefully this 
gives you guys a bit of an idea of uh, thinking outside the box and that there are alternatives. There is so much cheap hardware out there, it's ridiculous. People just get caught up on, I don't know, Googling Gravis Ultrasound and then, oh my God, it's 400 euros. Um, yeah, well, of course, if you want a Gravis Ultrasound, then you're basically a collector and it's going to cost you. Um, but there is so there are so many alternative parts that cost nothing that no one wants. Like, who would have ever thought that a wire socket A motherboard uh, will become interesting or desirable? Um, no one. So they're still going for very little money. And yeah, so that was a feature-packed video. I'll try to put some links in the description for some of the resources, but most of them are just on my website. And yeah, if you have any specific questions about anything you've seen in the video, don't be shy. Leave them down below in the comments. Uh, I'll try to answer them. Maybe someone else will. That's how the community operates. And yeah, let me know what other projects interest you. I haven't done anything with DOS in a while, mostly because I've kind of I kind of feel like I've done it all already. There are tutorials for installing DOS. There are tutorials how to build a machine, but I've haven't done a proper tutorial for using a socket A machine and I think this might be the next best thing if you want to build a DOS gaming machine but you don't want to spend too much money and yeah that's it guys thank you so much for watching as always if you enjoyed this video be sure to subscribe if you haven't done so already and give it a like share the video with your friends and your social media and that's it thank you for watching I shall see you soon with another one